Now let's go back to 16. Let's go back to 16. Let's go back to 15. <laughs> Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. <clears throat> now, here's the part I want you to really key in on. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, <clears throat> but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord <clears throat> out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may for, uh, recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Father, we thank you now for this time that we have together, fellowship with your people. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will reveal yourself to us through your word this evening. May, <clears throat> may some things be pointed out, may some things be said that will be a help, will be an encouragement, will be a blessing. So, Lord, have your will and have your way in these few minutes that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, I, I talk a lot about studying. We just, for the most part, brush it off. We hear it so often we don't hear it anymore. But a key to victorious Christian living is not necessarily reading, studying, study, study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed learning to rightly divide the word of truth. We're so prone to look at a verse and say, well, I, I know what that means, but it may not mean that at all. You may read a couple more verses and it'll shed some light on the first one you read and change the complete meaning of what you thought it meant. So we need to study, understand the context in which we're reading. So we are to study or to present ourselves or to endeavor to present ourselves approved unto God. And then verse 19 says, nevertheless, despite all these things that were going on in verses 16, 17, 18, where uh, those have erred concerning the truth. Some said the resurrection passed already and it affected the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure having this seal the lord knoweth them that are his let every one that nameth the name of christ depart from iniquity nevertheless connects the turning of some from the truth in verses 16 and 17 with the foundation of god standeth sure the foundation of the church and by the way the church is a called out assembly a called out assembly the word for church is ecclesia. And uh, God only established two entities, the home and the church. 
Here we're talking about the church, not, not talking about the building. We're not talking about this building that is sitting here on this piece of property. We're talking about a body of born-again believers to meet for the purpose of carrying out the Great Commission, uh, administering New Testament ordinances, which the only two that God has given us are baptism and the Lord's Supper, and then the exercising of spiritual gifts. That's what the church is. We, I think we get mixed up. We get misunderstand what the church is about sometimes. It becomes a social organization if we aren't careful uh, to the exclusion many times of the purpose for which the church has been called. Uh, the church was established to uh, baptize believers and administer the Lord's Supper. Jesus is the chief cornerstone of the church, not the pastor, not the deacons, not the Sunday school teachers. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of the church. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, and uh, verse 18, well, let's see. I say unto thee, Jesus is speaking, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, he's not saying that Peter is the chief cornerstone of the church. Uh, Peter was a stone, a little, a little stone. He's just a part of the church. The word is Petros. The word that Jesus Christ, Jesus is the big rock. He's the solid rock. He's the cornerstone, Petra. In 2 Peter, and by the way, I'm not preaching to you this evening. I'm studying with you. Uh, in 2 Peter, chapter 2, and verse 6. First Peter, chapter, chapter 2, and verse 6. Wherefore, also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that liveth on him, that believeth on him, shall not be confounded. And then in Ephesians, chapter 2, and verse 19 now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. God's firm foundation is unaffected by man's assaults. No matter what man tries to do to tear down the church, it ain't going to work. The church, now I realize that churches are closing by the hundreds to, across our country, by the thousands probably. Uh, small churches are going by the wayside. Big churches are getting smaller. People are falling away. But the church of God will never be destroyed. Never will it be destroyed. There will be, there'll be a, a testimony of Jesus Christ for as long as this earth stands. Uh, the turning of some from the truth does not affect the foundation. If God said it, that settles it. You've heard that, you've probably said this. I believe it. God said it, that settles it. Well, it settles it whether you believe it or not. If God said it, that settles it. And uh, your salvation is only as dependable as the foundation. The foundation. Your salvation depends upon him and not you. There are so many folks, and you were talking about the 
different kinds of churches and the different kinds of beliefs and, and the astounding beliefs that we run across, almost all of which involve a, some form of works. Very few are depending upon the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Uh, foundation is the most important part of any building. You know that. Almost everybody knows that. If you don't have a solid foundation, the house will not stand. It'll collapse under pressure. Uh, must be solid. The reason your salvation, the reason your salvation, maybe not you personally, but the reason that the salvation of so many is insecure is not built on the right foundation. Foundation. It may be built upon baptism. It may be built upon church membership. It may be built upon uh, being a worker in the church or uh, doing something, you know, doing busy stuff in the church and all that. That may be, that may, may be your foundation. It may be your, your works or your feelings. None of that will suffice. I don't care how many things you do and how hard you work in the church. If you do not know Jesus Christ in a personal way, intimately, you're lost. That's what the Bible says. Be sure that your salvation is built on the solid rock. In Matthew uh, chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7 and beginning in verse 21. Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that home, on that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. You know, I'm not a builder, certainly, but I know some builders, and I have looked with amazement at the skyscrapers in some of the cities. I... Uh, I was associated with Hartford Life Insurance Company for several years. Their office building was in Pittsburgh in a 50-story building. Our office was on floor number 32. And I, I looked at those buildings from the outside and just in amazement, you know, an old country boy, looking at the skyscrapers and wondering how on earth they stand. Well, I found out that core drillers came in there and they drilled way, 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 way down. And they tested the soil, they tested the rock and, and the foundation, the steel, uh, the pillars and so forth go far beneath the, the foundation of the, of the I mean the uh, uh, level of the ground. There's probably as much foundation under the ground as there is above it. And uh, that's the way it is with, with Christian people. We need a solid foundation. Our roots need to grow deep, deep, deep. Otherwise, when trouble comes, hardship comes, we'll, we'll panic. We fall apart. Uh, it's good to know. It is absolutely wonderful to know that no matter what happens in this world, and by the way, we don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen in my life, nor in your life before we go to bed tonight. There could be catastrophe in any of our lives. But I am so glad to report to you that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of the church 
And it's on him that I'm resting and depending. I'm not depending on what I can do if trouble comes. I'm depending on the one that I know who can do whatever needs to be done. Um, so, verse 21, back in, the, in Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, I guess it was. Chapter 7, verse 21. Uh, well, I'm lost. <laughs> 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will. That's what I'm looking for. That doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. What is the Father's will? That's a good question. What's the Father's will? It is the Father's will that we repent of our sins and place our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And then, in addition, surrender to the Lordship of Christ. You know, it's one thing, it's one thing to be saved and know him in pardon and forgiveness, but it's something else to surrender one's life. Most of us want to withhold a few areas. We have we have a few dark areas in our life that we want to hide, we want to hold back, we don't want to reveal, we don't want to give it up. He wants us to surrender to the Lordship of Christ. I have a problem, I have a, I have a question in my mind. How can one come to know Christ and knowingly and willingly at the same time not be willing to let him be the Lord of your life. Does that make any sense? When I got saved, I promised the Lord that I would serve him. I promised, I said, Lord, whatever I have that you can use, take it and use it. And I didn't know I had anything. But I told the Lord, if you'll save me, I'll serve you. He did, and I have. And life has been great. It's been good. Now, not every moment, not every place I've ever been to serve has been perfect. There have been some, there have been some places I probably shouldn't have gone, probably shouldn't have, uh, shouldn't have served there, but, but I did, and I learned from it. Everywhere I went, I learned something. I learned a lot of in some place, I learned how not to do things. What not to do. Don't do that, ever. And I've benefited from that as time has gone on. You just don't do some things as a pastor. Then we come to verse, uh, the second part of verse 19. And, and again, I remind you that I didn't have any time to prepare today. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fumbling and struggling here. Verse 19, back in 2 Timothy, the second part of verse 19, says, well, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Having this seal. Many buildings have a seal on the foundation that has some sort of inscription. You know what I'm talking about? You see a school building somewhere or a hospital and a cornerstone somewhere has, has the year it was built and who built it and who the architects were and, and such. The seal here was affixed to the foundation and it seems to, seems to refer to some inscription, uh, inscription on the foundation stone which always remained there and which denoted the character and the design of the building. The church is a building that was built by the hands of God himself. Its foundation is securely laid on that foundation. On that foundation there is the permanent inscription determining the character of the building. This is God's house. This is God's thing, not man's. 
This is the seal of security. There are a number of seals that we deal with. There's a notary seal. Just last week I had to go to a notary and get something notarized. And what they're doing, well, the only thing the notary public is doing is, is acknowledging and swearing to the fact that that is my signature. They're not talking about the accuracy of the document, but they're just notarizing my signature. That's all. But so, so what does it mean when a notary notarizes something and stamps his seal on that? It means the deal's done. It is officially over. It's done, complete. Then there's uh, you ladies who can, and I guess that's, I don't know if that's a thing of the past or not. I know with freezers, people don't can like they used to. But you know what it is when you can and you, you put those beans in a pressure cooker and you cook them and, and then you wait for them to seal. They go, and you know they're sealed. You know they're not going to spoil. It's a done deal. It's over. This, this is good. Used to work for the power company, and had, every meter has a seal on it, has AP on that seal. Nobody but a representative of the company is authorized to remove that seal. And when you seal that thing, Supposedly it's secure, not always was, but it's supposedly it was. But the Lord has put the seal on his church. He says, the Lord knoweth them that are his. It's a done deal. You've been born again by the Spirit of God. And he says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me he didn't say if they if it's something they want to do they follow me he didn't say if they feel good someday they follow me he said my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me they follow me so are we following Christ are we following Christ Christ tells us a lot there's a lot in this big book that we have to study to know what it says. You say, well, I, don't, I, I, I haven't studied, so I don't know what it says, so, so maybe he'll excuse me through ignorance. I don't think so, because he said, study to show thyself approved. Ignorance is no excuse. I've tried that on a state trooper one time. Didn't work then either. By the way, right I had a, had a friend from Akron, Ohio, who uh, came to visit yesterday at the farm. He spent 34 years uh, with the Akron Police Department. And uh, he's now with the U.S. Marshal Service. He's uh, courtroom security. And uh, we, uh, we had the best time talking about police stories. <laughs> I had some good ones myself. But uh, the Lord knows them that are his. It's a great comfort to those who are his, those who are saved by grace, to know that beyond any shadow of doubt that when I leave this world, I'm going to heaven. There's nothing better. I can remember before I was saved, there were times when I was very restless had no peace. When I lay down at night, I would be, the last thought would be, I hope I wake up in the morning because I know where I'll go if I don't. I don't, I don't do that anymore. I'm the greatest, I'm the best sleeper in the world. Boy, when the light goes out, I'm gone. I'm gone. And I'm gone until Ryder says, hey, wake up. You need to go to the bathroom? <laughs> the surety, the seal of security. Uh, 
the seal of security, a great comfort to know that he is mine and I'm his. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Amen. The day, what's the day when he comes? What have I committed, my soul? I have committed my soul to his loving care until he comes to get me. And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that when, 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 the, when the end of this life is over, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Nobody can go with you when you cross that river. Your husband can't go, your, your wife can't go, your children can't go, the pastor can't go. I've been to the edge of the river many times with people. I've held their hand, I've prayed with them. But I couldn't cross the river with them. Just went to the edge. But boy, the old song, when I come to the river at ending of day and the last winds of sorrow have blown, there'll be somebody waiting to show me the way. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. I won't have to cross Jordan alone because Jesus died all my sins to atone. When the darkness I see, he'll be waiting for me. <laughs> Praise God, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. And you won't either if you know him. That sealing spirit. Then there's, then there's the sealing spirit. We've talked about the, the cans and the meter seals and the notaries. How about the sealing spirit, that inward assurance? Do you have that inward assurance? Is there a seal on your heart that says you won't have to cross Jordan alone? That seal that says, you know, I'm kind of looking forward to it. Yesterday I had, yesterday was my son's birthday. I thought about him a lot yesterday. I thought, what a, what a day that's going to be. When I get there, and I see Jesus, and I see Gary, and I embrace him, and hold him. What a time. Man, in that sense, I look forward to leaving this world and going to heaven. I don't fear it, not one bit. Man's responsibility as a Christian is to recognize the Lordship of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, very familiar verses, 19 and 20. What? Do you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You don't belong to you. I don't belong to me. I don't have a right to do anything I want to and say anything I want to. I belong to him. I'm his representatives. I'm his ambassador in this world. I got to I got to do what he wants me to do, not what I am inclined to do. You see we're inclined to behave a certain way, but as we think about what he would have me do, that changes things. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Total surrender to him involves, or it solves the problems of legalism. Back in the 70s, I was assistant pastor at Johnston Chapel with Brother Jimmy Jones. We had a very vibrant, growing church. And uh, we had some folks, I think I might have mentioned this a week or two ago, we had some, some folks that started, this is, this is when independent Baptists frowned upon facial hair and, and long hair down on the shoulders and things like that, they frowned on it. And uh, 
I went to a, I went to a pastor school, Hammond, Indiana, Jack Hall's pastor school. And uh, I came back, I was young and impressionable, and I came back with some, some ideas. And I told the pastor, I said, I'm going to clean this choir up. We had some guys in there growing a beard, letting their hair grow. And I said, I'm going to make a set of rules. He said, Jerry, you're my music director. And I will not undermine you. I'll not tell you that I gave you the job and it's yours. But just let me give you a word of caution. If you enforce these rules, your choir is going to turn into a quartet. I didn't enforce the rules. I backed off of that. And turned to grace. Grace. You see, Christians don't have rules. Christians are subjected to the grace of God. Grace of God. I don't believe in rules. I don't believe in the law. I believe in his grace. Recognize the lordship of, of, of Christ. But uh, it is strange that uh, on Sundays there's a uh, disease that I heard about years ago that seems to flare up on Sunday. It's called Morbus Sabbaticus. You ever heard of it? Morbus Sabbaticus. Get sick on Sunday morning, but you get better late Sunday night. It's very contagious, too. It's a common disease. It's very contagious because... If one church member gets it, probably there's going to be two or three more get it too. They say, well, let's go to the races today. Let's go to the ball game today. Come and go with me. Contagious. We need to be vaccinated against Morbus Sabbaticus. And that is, I suggest... But a good dose of the grace, a good dose of the grace of God, would serve as the vaccination for that. There's no problem about what we should do on Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon or Sunday night. No problem whatsoever, if our life is surrendered to Christ. I don't have any problem with that. Never have any problem, because I promised the Lord the day I got saved, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to be faithful. I'll be in your house when the door's open. And I believe he's honored that. It only, it only does harm, I believe, to confront others about inconsistencies in their life. You know, we, we'll, have, uh, we'll have a lot of, we have absentees from time to time. They've been here. They've been faithful. They know what we trust, what we believe. They know what they ought to do, but they don't come. And for me to go and confront them, just leads to more antagonism. Second Timothy 2 says, avoid ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. You know, a pastor spends probably more of his time chasing after people he shouldn't have to chase after than any other one thing. People who know better. And that they may come to their senses and do the will of God. Chastened not by the pastor, but by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Christians who don't come to church. Why should the pastor sacrifice time to seeing people that want to be seen and need to be seen and run after people that have no interest in being, being seen? Does that make sense? The life that is surrendered departs from iniquity. The surrendered life does what there is to do at any given time. The surrendered life reports for duty daily, daily. Not dependent on how he feels, not dependent on uh, what's, what event is taking place in the neighborhood or any of that. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, deny himself. 
take up his cross and follow me. How often? Daily. 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 Every person should be saved, sealed, separated. Sealed represents the assurance of salvation. Easiest way to be separated is to be surrendered. Are you surrendered? Are you surrendered? Well, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer.